is Sandra Brower, and I'm the program lead for the Bachelor of Arts Theology and Ministry at Cliff College. At Cliff, we're committed to theology and ministry for the real world in word and spirit. I've been thinking in these past few weeks about what that might mean to someone who's considering starting a theology degree. You might think now is a strange time to uh, start anything new, and I think we're all feeling a little bit like that. Uh, these past few weeks, I've had much more time to spend in my garden, which you can see behind me. And this year, more than any, I've been awakened to the miracle of spring in a new way. The whole world is in global lockdown, but that just can't stop nature. And it reminded me of something we like to say at Cliff, that theology and ministry never stops. It just changes shape. Just today, I've been planting some seeds, uh, and over the next few weeks, I will uh, tend them faithfully in hopes that in a month or so, I'll have a crop of lettuce to harvest. Made me wonder if God is planting any seeds in your life right now, and maybe one of them is a desire to dig deeper into scripture or to probe intentionally uh, into the theological issues and questions that are really pertinent for our world today, and certainly in our world right now. You know, we're open uh, and we're accepting applications for September right now. Uh, we may be adapting to a new normal, uh, but we will be open. And I'd like you to consider joining us. We'd love to welcome you to our community and to help you cultivate the seeds that God might be planting in your life right now. Join us and with us, commit to theology and ministry for the real world today. Go. Hi, my name's Cathy Thacker and I work at Cliff College. Up until last year I was part of the leadership team for Festival and it was my great privilege to help to put it together for seven years. I'm going to really miss not being there this year. I think there's two great things about Festival. One of them is that we have always tried really hard to make it a festival that is for all ages. We've tried to make sure that there is something for everyone and I think on the whole that we have achieved this. Obviously there's always more that can be done and we're improving it year on year but I think that that is a really great, unique, distinct thing. And the second thing that I uh, really love about Festival is the opportunities that we've been able to give the students over the years. We've given them opportunities to lead worship in the main tent, to lead the youth venues, to lead the children's venues, to serve. And I think that we have created men and women who will be able to serve the kingdom of God better because of the opportunities that they have had at festival over the years. I really hope that you enjoy festival at home this year. Normally you'd find me behind the desk uh, at reception at festival and this year of course we're unable to do that but I thought I would say hello anyway hope that you're all doing well I'm sad not to be able to see all the faces as people arrive answer all your questions make sure that your time at festival is an enjoyable one but hopefully you know what time dinner is going to be served and um, you know where your toilets are and you won't have to queue for showers if you're uh, watching from home this year so I hope that you are having a blessed time you're encouraged by this time as festival at home and uh, I also want to say a special hello uh, and a big miss you to Enid and Ivor as well. So enjoy the rest of Festival at Home and I'll be tuning in alongside you and hopefully we will catch up soon. Hello, I'm Ian White and I'm the senior tutor of the college and from a very blowy garden in Sheffield, I have two things linked to Cliff College just behind me and to Cliff College anniversary celebration that became Cliff College Festival. Anybody recognise these from Cliff College Terrace many, many years ago when we used to sit outside, not under canvas, with our brollies up when it rained and listen to the good news of Jesus? Hello. I'm Becky. My name's Ben. I'm Nathan. 
I study maths and physics at Warwick University. I'm a student, I'm studying theology and youth work at um, Regents Bible College. I'm a uni student from Florida. I'm studying international business. So I'm doing this road trip with Nathan and Ben. We're travelling around the UK, we're meeting people from a whole different range of perspectives who um, are within the Methodist tradition. Talking about a range of challenging issues. I feel like we just don't chat about them in church enough. I've got these questions about what I believe. So anyone who's just looking to find out more, this should be really helpful. It's going to be one heck of a ride. My name's Tim Baker and I'm the Churches and Volunteers Manager at All We Can. And it's been my privilege to be at Cliff Festival many times over the last few years, always in my role as part of the All We Can team. So it's been my pleasure to lead seminars and to have lots of really good conversations in the marketplace. And it's those conversations in the marketplace that will always be my endearing memories of Cliff Festival brilliant conversations about people's discipleship, about people's spiritual growth, times of prayer, times where we've learned and grown together. So this Cliff Festival, as we do festival at home, we're excited to be part of the All We Can team again and to be bringing our digital fire pit, a place where we can gather around this fire as people have gathered for centuries to pray, to reflect, to tell stories and to share about our own discipleship and our own journey. We hope that you'll gather with us this festival at home. you'd find me behind the desk uh, at reception at festival and this year of course we're unable to do that but I thought I would say hello anyway hope that you're all doing well I'm sad not to be able to see all the faces as people arrive answer all your questions make sure that your time at festival is an enjoyable one but hopefully you know what time dinner is going to be served and um, you know where your toilets are and you won't have to queue for showers if you're uh, watching from home this year so I hope that you are having a blessed time, you're encouraged by this time as festival at home. And uh, I also want to say a special hello uh, and a big miss you to Enid and Iva as well. So enjoy the rest of festival at home and I'll be tuning in alongside you and hopefully we will catch up soon. Hello. I'm Becky. 
My name's Ben. I'm Nathan. I study maths and physics at Warwick University. I'm a student. I'm studying theology and youth work at um, Regents Bible College. I'm a uni student from Florida. I'm studying international business. So I'm doing this road trip with Nathan and Ben. We're travelling around the UK, we're meeting people from a whole different range of perspectives who um, are within the Methodist tradition. Talking about a range of challenging issues. I feel like we just don't chat about them in church enough. I've got these questions about what I believe. So anyone who's just looking to find out more, this should be really helpful. It's going to be one heck of a ride. My name's Tim Baker and I'm the Churches and Volunteers Manager at All We Can. It's been my privilege to be at Cliff Festival many times over the last few years, always in my role as part of the All We Can team. So it's been my pleasure to lead seminars and to have lots of really good conversations in the marketplace. And it's those conversations in the marketplace that will always be my endearing memories of Cliff Festival. Brilliant conversations about people's discipleship, about people's spiritual growth, times of prayer, times where we've learned and grown together. So this Cliff Festival, as we do festival at home, we're excited to be part of the All We Can team again and to be bringing our digital fire pit, a place where we can gather around this fire as people have gathered for centuries to pray, to reflect, to tell stories and to share about our own discipleship and our own journey. We hope that you'll gather with us this festival at home. Festival viewers. Our seminar speaker for this session is award-winning scholar activist Dr. Miguel de la Torre. Miguel has focused his academic career on the pursuit of social ethics within contemporary U.S. thought. He specifically looks at how religion affects racism, class, and gender oppression. Over the course of the weekend, Miguel will take us on a journey of hope, asking tough questions and giving us some even tougher answers. I introduce to you, Professor of Social Ethics and Latinx Studies at Iliff School of Theology in Denver, Colorado, Dr. Miguel de la Torre. Hello, my name is Miguel de la Torre. I am the Professor of Social Ethics and Latinx Studies at the Iliff School of Theology in Denver, Colorado. And in this third session, we wanna talk about hoping against all hope. In other words, we've, we, in the last two sessions, we talked about embracing hopelessness. We talked about trying to move beyond hopelessness. And now I wanna to try to deal with how do we actually interact um, in faith in the midst of hopelessness? How do we, as Paul would write, hope against all hope? Uh, the global structures that are causing oppression um, specifically neoliberalism, globalization in the form of colonialism, um, is being um, exacerbated by the coronavirus. Um, the situation is becoming even worse um, than it was 
before uh, February, uh, before January, what it was last year. All too often, we assume that to be hopeless is to be in despair. And that's the wrong definition. Um, when we are hopeless, we can either give up and roll up in a ball and um, gnash our teeth. Um, that is what poverty despair is. We could become cynical and, and, and just do absolutely nothing but just uh, be cynical of the whole system and of the whole structures. Or hopelessness can propel us towards action, which is what I talked about in, in some of these last sessions. Hopelessness propels us towards action. In an unjust, unjust world, to be hopeless is to reject easy fixes, easy solutions, and easy answers to what ails our world. It is not despair, it is desperation. Because see, desperation propels us to do something. It is so horrible right now that I have no other choice but to move forward because if I stay, I die. This is what causes so many people in the southwestern part of the United States uh, to cross the border from Mexico to the US, knowing that they might die in the desert. In fact, every four days, five brown bodies perish on our southern border. But the desperation of staying where they are propels them towards action, towards praxis. So when I'm embracing hopelessness, what I am embracing is this radical action, this radical praxis that moves us forward towards something that's more liberative than what we have now. Yes, we can fall into despair. We can become cynical. We can you know, um, uh, begin to, to find other destructive ways um, like drugs or alcohol or spousal abuse to deal with the hopelessness of the situation or we can channel that energy towards praxis that could maybe change things, that could maybe move us towards something more just. And that has been the foundation of why I want to embrace hopelessness, even though it sounds so counterproductive to the gospel message. Hope, we must remember, according to 1 Corinthians 13, 13, is not a feeling. It is instead a product of love. Acting as if I have hope that it's all going to work out, divorce from any love praxis becomes a disingenuous feeling. If we hope things will work out, then we must become the hope to the very least of these, to those who are hungry and thirsty, to those who are naked and undocumented, to those who are infirm and incarcerated. What is the hope that we bring to the shut-in who's unable to wash her hands because the utility company shut off her water because she could not pay? What hope do we bring the widow who does not receive enough of a government stipend to be able to buy the grocery she or he needs to survive uh, being in isolation uh, during lockdown? What hope do we bring in, this, in, in the United States to the immigrant child who, 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 who finds themselves in a for-profit prison locked up with a hundred other children that the virus could just enter into that space and literally have deadly effects. And what hope do we have, can we afford to doctors and nurses and, 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 and the, the volunteers at hospitals who are risking their lives without having the proper equipment, at least in the United States, to do their job? You see, James 2.16 tells us 
that if we just say, go in peace, stay warm and well fed, and do not provide for physical needs of the individuals, then what good is that? James tells us that faith without works is dead. Likewise, I would argue that hope without action is dead. And the reason why I want us to embrace hopelessness is because hopelessness divorces us from praxis and action that could change the social structures because all we're doing is dreaming of some heaven and not paying attention to the suffering and the oppression and the repression going on here on earth. Hope like love and joy only abounds when we give it away. When we are faithful in being Jesus rather than simply just talking about Jesus. For those of you who know your philosophy, you probably recognize that one of the individuals who are influencing the way I'm thinking is Miguel de Unomuno, the Spanish philosopher of the early 1900s, who many would call the um, unbelieving believer. You see, for him, as he would argue, it doesn't really matter if there's a God or not. That's not what's important. What's important is believing in God as if God actually exists. That is, we're not trying to seek the answers as to what is the correct doctrine as to why we are suffering, but rather we're seeking the correct actions, the correct praxis that needs to be employed so that we could be fully aware of the injustice that the correct actions um, may actually signal um, our demise if they're not enacted upon. Is there a heaven or not? Fine, why not? I've, I have my fire insurance, I have a mansion picked out, that's fine. But even if, let's say, there is no heaven, why are you doing what you are doing? Are you fighting for justice because you're going to get some reward when you get to heaven? Or are you fighting for justice because you think you actually may win? You see, you may not win. And maybe there's not a heaven. You fight for, for justice. Not because you think you're going to win or because you're going to get a reward. You fight for justice because it defines your very faith and it defines your very humanity. One of the the problems that we have is that we believe that somehow our good works are going to open up doors for us in heaven. And, and I guess what I'm arguing, like Miguel de Unomuno, it doesn't matter if there's a heaven or not. That's not why we do what we do. We do what we do because we say we believe a God exists. And let me be very clear here. I don't know if there's a God or not. I really don't. There's no way I can prove that God exists. By the same token, there's no way I can prove that God does not exist. Belief in a God or rejection of a God is purely a choice. That's why they call it faith. Because if it could be proven, it would not be faith, it would be science. But we have faith that there is a God, regardless of if there is one or not, and because we have faith, we find this God whom we say we believe in when we stand in solidarity with whom Jesus incarnates himself. For that which you do to the least of these you have done to me. It's not that Jesus is among the, the hungry and the thirsty, the naked and the, and, and the immigrant, the incarcerated and the infirm. Jesus is the naked, the hungry, the thirsty, the immigrant, the infirm, the incarcerated. And my solidarity with the least of these, with the hopeless, becomes that inward, um, that, 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 I'm sorry, that becomes the outward expression of this inward faith 
that I claim to have. So, if neoliberalism won, if oppression will continue in our lifetime, if racism and sexism and, and classism and heterosexism continue to be the, the dominant force of this world, then surely the battle for justice is lost in our lifetime. We're not going to overturn this. These structures of oppression will continue. It is truly hopeless. But if I embrace that hopelessness, then I guarantee you I probably will not burn out. I probably will not be willing to give up. I'll give you an example. I have been working on immigration rights in the United States for the last 15, 20 years. And it is worse now than it was 15, 20 years ago. It's enough for me to say enough of this. Nothing's changing. It's only going to get worse. I'm burned out. I'm going to go ahead and watch TV instead. But I don't do that. Not because I'm a saint or because I'm holier than thou. I don't do it because to ignore the oppressed denies the faith that I claim to have and it voids the character of God that I say exists. So you see, it doesn't matter if there's a God or not. What matters is what is the character of this God to whom I say. I have faith in. Privilege means I can walk away. Privilege means that I could just say it's hopeless, so who cares? Those of us who have lived under very oppressive conditions have come to the realization we can never walk away. That's what it means to hope in the midst of hopelessness. So how, what becomes the ethical response? And, and, and as I mentioned um, in the beginning of each one of these three sessions, I am an ethicist. And as an ethicist, I am more concerned with how we live our life, what actions we take than any theological truth. In fact, I really could care less what you theologically believe. That is unimportant. The reason is unimportant because when we both get to heaven, we're going to find out how wrong both of us were anyway. The only thing that's important is how we live out this faith that we claim. And the way that I am arguing for the oppressed to live out their faith is through a radical action, which I call um, an action, uh, an ethics para joder. And before I explain that, let me let me explain the situation and where the oppressor of the world find himself. We have to go to the police department to get a permit from the police department so we can protest the police department for police brutality. You see, we have created these structures in where I can protest as long as I do it within the rules. The rules that are enacted by those who are in power who are privileged by how those rules operate. I could protest, I could yell, I could carry a sign as long as I do not upset the equilibrium of society. I mean, put it this way, the United States is the only country I know that you can drive to a march. And yet, think about that. We have the privilege of driving so that we can march. I could make my sign. I could, I could feel good about myself. I, I could, I could uh, cry for justice. And at the end of the day, nothing changes. In fact, for many liberals, getting arrested becomes their badge of, of honor. And every so often, and I have somebody, one of my students comes up to me and says, hey, we're all going to go protesting and get arrested. Dr. De La Torre, please come join us. And, and my response is usually, I'm a Latino man in the United States. Getting arrested is not that difficult for people like me. Uh, when the vast majority 
of those in prison today are people who are also Latinx. So no thank you, I have no desire of getting arrested um, because I don't need to prove how liberal I am and how down for the cause I really am. Um, in that society, in where everything that smells of rebellion is domesticated, we have to design a way of doing ethics that does not play by the rules of those who benefit from the rules. Think of Jesus walking into the temple and literally overturning the tables of the bankers who were ripping off the people. In effect, Jesus was screwing with the system. Now, I have developed what I call an ethics para joder. Now, for those of you who know Spanish, I apologize for my cursing because joder is one of those words you never use in polite conversation. It is uh, similar to a certain four letter English word that begins with F and ends with K. Um, an ethics para joder is an ethics that screws with the structures. It's an ethic that messes up um, what has been ordained as orderly. And, and, and let me give you a couple of uh, examples of where I'm getting this ethics para joder from. Uh, never forget I was in Mexico speaking to a Chiapa rebel. And, and the rebel was telling me how um, <coughs> he um, went to the government office when um, they tried to take away his land. Uh, through, you know, increasing his taxes where he could not pay it. And, and when he went there, the bureaucrat behind the desk took one look at him and said, ah, you smelly Indian, uh, uh, get out of here, um, you know, just go. So he left and he showed up um, the next day with a bandana and, and an AK-47 and he says, you know what, the bureaucrats listened to me. We, we had an interesting conversation. We worked out a payment plan, so I kept my land. In other words, he was screwing with the system. I would argue that when Jesus entered that temple and overthrew those bankers' tables, he was screwing with the system. Uh, for those of you who remember that very first lecture I did on um, embracing hopelessness, um, I argued at that time that we need to use the symbols of our own culture. So, so that's, this is what I'm doing when I develop this form of doing ethics. Um, in New York City, back in 1969, there was this gang known as the Young Lords. They were in New York City and they were also in Chicago and other major urban centers in the North, in, in the north and Northeast that had large um, Latinx population. So, so in, uh, Harlem, in, in Spanish Harlem, New York, which was not that far away from where I was living and growing up at the time, the young lord went ahead and they swept up all the streets. They went ahead and they collected all the garbage and they put them in bags. And then they went ahead and put them in the corner and they called the um, sanitation department and they said, look, we cleaned up our streets. Uh, there's bags of garbage in the corner. Please come by and, and, and pick them up. And the sanitation department laughed at them and said, ah, yeah, we'll come up whenever we feel like it. You see, back in the late 60s, the sanitation department would only show up um, whenever they felt like showing up and not um, on a regular basis. So what the young laws did was they got all those garbage bags and they went to Third Avenue, which is a major third, uh, uh, street in uh, New York City, and they built a three, four foot wall and they set it on fire. Uh, of course, the, uh, the uh, fire department came, the police came, they beat them up, they threw them in jail. But something interesting happened. The New York Times also showed up and they started doing articles about the Young Lords and about the garbage offensive and about how the sanitation department was not doing this job of cleaning up the streets on a regular basis. Um, what ended up happening is that now the sanitation department goes through um, El Barrio every Tuesdays and Fridays. In other words, by screwing with the systems, they were able 
to bring about radical change. It didn't bring total liberation, but it did move things a little closer towards justice. One of the other things that they did, which, which, which I've always found fascinating, is um, on, on Palm, no, I'm sorry, uh, three weeks before Christmas, they went ahead and went to, um, to uh, La Primera Iglesia uh, Metodista, which was in, um, in, in Spanish Harlem. And they went to the pastor and said, look, pastor, we want to go ahead and have um, a, a food kitchen to feed our children on their way to school. We want to have a clothes drive. We want to go ahead and have an attorney here to help um, our, our, our residents get legal help with landlord issues. We want to go ahead and provide classes for consciousness raising. And the pastor looked at them and said, ah, you bunch of commies, get out of here. So they showed up the next Sunday and they picked up the pastor and they threw him out of the church and they nailed on the front door in red letters the sign that said the people's church. And for the next couple of weeks, literally they became the people's church. The church was full of people who came for all these services that the young lords wanted to provide until the cops came, beat them up and threw them in jail. The point of the story is that the young lords methodology, ethical methodology, was to hold those in power, government and church, hold them accountable to the rhetoric that they claim to believe in. In other words, they were literally screwing with the government and with the church to force them to act in a way that was more just and fairer and equitable. One of, the, um, one, of, one, of, one of the symbols that I'm using in this ethics para Joren comes from the Afro-Cuban tradition known as Santeria, in where you have a trickster image, which is, um, in my culture, it's El Egua. But in the Mexican culture, it's um, Cantinfra. Uh, among an indigenous people, which are also make up the Chicano culture, which is part of our culture, is um, uh, spider and, um, and, and coyote. Um, so, so, so our oppressed culture, not just from my Latinx background, but also the African-American culture has bear rabbit and bear bear. Oppressed groups usually have trickster images within their spirituality. And what the trickster does is that through humor, uh, through um, nonviolence, they they, they mess things up. They overturn the order. They shout from the mountaintop that which we would prefer to keep silent. Um, this ethics para joder becomes a way of upsetting the apple cart, of upsetting the social structures that we need them to remain stable if we want oppression to continue. So, this ethics by the Hore becomes a, a critical way of dealing with how do we lie to find out what's true? How, how do we steal to, to be able to feed the hungry? How do we cheat so that we could be equitable um, and overturn oppressive structures? And I would argue that this ethics by the Hore, this methodology is very biblical. You have Tamar in the Hebrew Bible, in the book of Genesis, playing the prostitute so as to trick Judah um, into allowing her to marry her youngest, uh, his youngest uh, son. Uh, you have King David playing uh, a mad person, a madman, uh, so that uh, the king of another kingdom would not kill him. Um, you have uh, Satan uh, playing the trickster in the wilderness with Jesus. Um, as to, um, you know, make these bread into, um, I'm sorry, make these stones into bread, uh, tempting him with possession, or jump off the roof of the temple and the angels will catch you, tempting him with um, privilege, or bow before me and all these kingdoms will be yours, uh, tempting him with power. But Jesus rejects the, 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 the trickster, and in so doing, discovers what his ministry is. And from that point on, 
his ministry um, is launched. So, so the image of tricksters is throughout the biblical text. Our Puritan way of reading the Bible has really um, um, obscured this richness within the biblical text. Well, one day the coronavirus is going to pass away. Um, the question I think before us is that, yes, we may have preserved our life, but at, at what cost? For, for what does it profit to gain the whole world and in the process lose our soul? And we lose our soul by um, rejecting love-based praxis that is less concerned with having hope and more concerned with giving hope. Socrates, the philosopher, once said that the unexamined life is not worth living. And by the same token, the unexamined faith is really not worth having. We are in the midst of a, of a global pandemic. Um, this is the ultimate test of faith, I would believe. Will our legacy be how much toilet paper we hoarded? Or would it be how much hope did we provide to the hopeless? Rather than expecting hope, how do we become the hope for those who are the least among us? And not just how do we become the hope in such nice, friendly feeling, but literally how do we become hope by overturning the tables that is reinforcing um, these oppressive structures? I fight for justice, not because I have the hope I'm going to win. I fight for justice because it defines my very humanity and it defines my very faith. Thank you.